took her family to the Netherlands as a toddler. She studied visual arts and medicine in high school in Amsterdam and then completed a four-year art degree at the Rijkveld Academy in Amsterdam while also attending medical school. I mean, I don't, like, I don't even know how that's possible. But, um, she practiced medicine in Guyana where she witnessed the aftermath of illegal abortions and moved into this specialization. By the late 90s, Gompertz was sailing with the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior as a doctor and environmentalist, and here is where her commitment to reproductive health really solidified. Um, she started working with art school contacts to help her design and fund a mobile clinic on a boat that could circulate to countries with no reproductive rights or education for women. That initiative is Women on Waves. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that. Founded in 1999 by Gompertz. Uh, the boat sailed to Ireland, Poland, Portugal, and other countries. And of course, we'd now be happy to welcome that to the United States. Uh, by 2005, it was becoming clear that re reproductive rights activism required public relations and educational campaigns. Women on Web is a related organization devoted to serving as a clearinghouse to direct women to sources for abortion pills and to organize the delivery of these medications. And in 2016, she founded Aid Access, particularly for the U.S. context, to provide medical abortion materials to women across the country. We're so honored to have you at USC, Dr. Winkler. Very much. Um, so I am going to uh, unleash a storm of images over you uh, and jump from one place to another. So I hope uh, uh, you won't lose the way. Um, but I think we need to get the thing off. Yeah, okay. So. Um, do you want to hold the mic or do you want to. Oh, oh no, I will there? stand here. No, that's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I will jump for a little bit. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to speak at an art school outside the normal um, medical uh, public. Um, and um, okay, so I will start. Um, so this is what you have to do when you do a medical presentation. You have to say that you don't have any conflict of interest, which I have, of course, but I always put it on the slide. <laughs> so, um, the, the, so I'm going to take you to the worldwide abortion landscape, something about abortion pills. I'm going to infuse images of some of the art collaborations that we did as well um, and take you through the voyage that I've been taking the last 20 years. Um, so when you talk about abortion, it's always about politics. It's never about common sense or science or it's always politics. And when you look at the current political situation, Many of the authoritarian regimes in the world are restricting abortion access, uh, including the US under Trump. Um, and, uh, but uh, Putin is doing it in Russia, in Hungary, in Turkey, uh, in Poland. These are all very autocratic regimes. Um, and so it's, uh, it's like the, the, the bird in the coal mine. Uh, when abortion access is restricted, it's also affecting usually um, uh, freedom of press, uh, all the other kinds of human rights. Um, so this is a collaboration that I did with Willem Feldhoven. He's a designer uh, in the Netherlands with Mediamatic. And this was a, a, a photo from 1999, where we made the first I Had an Abortion t-shirts. Um, and uh, so, of course, people are saying, like, um, there was Hillary Clinton, actually, that said, oh, we have to make abortion rare. Well, it's never rare and will never be rare. So if we look at the developments in the last uh, eight years. Um, this is the map of abortion laws in 2014. And you see, you, if you pay, pay attention to South Korea, to Argentina, uh, Colombia, Mexico, uh, Ireland, uh, you can see in the next slide that all these places legalized abortion. So there, there has been a huge advantage going towards legalization. Uh, Thailand legalized abortion, South Korea legalized abortion, Ireland legalized abortion. Um, Argentina, 
Colombia and some other places, and only the U.S. became a striped state. So, but overall, actually, it, there's it's positive news. Um, and so, um, when we think about abortion, uh, one of the, of course, one of the uh, myth is that it's uh, it's very dangerous. Um, and if you look at the danger of abortion compared with you know, for example, plastic surgery, you see that an abortion is much safer than having plastic surgery. Um, so this is another campaign that we did together with um, the Yes Men. I don't know if you know them. We did a training there. So we set up a fake diesel campaign. Diesel is the clothing mark. Um, and we had a whole photo shoot where we imitated the uh, uh, for successful living. That was their, their quote at, at that time. Um, and so this was launched online, and we got, you know, diesel contacted us that we had to take it off immediately because they would sue us. But it was to, it was to, it was to address a different um, a group of people. So it was very widely um, exposed in the fashion world. Of course, nobody understood it because it was much too complicated. We had diesel, we had metropolis, we had too many like ideas um, infused in this. Um, but the idea was also to make abortion pills known. And, and uh, when I started working uh, around abortion, I was trained as an abortion provider doing surgical abortions. And medical abortions just became available in the Netherlands in 90, around um, 2000. Um, and so for me, it was something new as well. And it was only, you know, during the work that we really started grasping the in enormous revolutionary power of, of the abortion pills because with the pills, it's so safe. You don't need any providers. You're not dependent on anybody. The only thing you need is access to the pills and information on how to use them. So everybody needs to know this. You just have to, uh, I think, wherever you travel, wherever you go, you need to be able to know what you have to look for. It's my crystal that's almost available everywhere um, and how to use it in order to, you know, to be able to give access to a safe abortion. Um, so this is again one of the images where uh, you see the, the robot from Metropolis. I don't know if you know the film. Of, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so if we look at the maps of abortion pills available, you can see the um, the pistol is almost everywhere registered. And the Mifepistone is less registered, but it's much better. And there are some organizations around the world that have done a lot of work around it. Uh, DKT International is a U.S. organization. They have done a lot of work of making it available in many countries, even where it is, uh, abortion is legally restricted. So if you look at access, you know, there's different ways. You, have it, you can get it from a regular pharmacy, which actually just was introduced in the Netherlands two years ago. Before, you had to, could only get it in special clinics and in hospitals. Um, and I can proudly say it's partly because of our work that it's now in a pharmacy. Black market, it's almost everywhere. Uh, the special clinics, it's still in Italy, Germany, etc. And then telemedicine, which became really, really widely available. Also, because of COVID, it, it propelled it forward because then telemedicine was more mainstreamed anyway. But UK was the first one to accept it. Uh, USA, Canada, France, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand. Um, it's now standard medical care, telemedical abortion care. But that was not always the case. Um, and for example, now, if you see the guidelines, for example, these are the guidelines around self-managed abortion from the World Health Organization. They are advising self-managed abortion. Um, but we, it took us 20 years to get there uh, and, and research even 30 years of research. Um, but this is extremely important because it, it's just that all the main uh, guidelines. This is the World Health Organization guideline that often says recommends the option of telemedicine. Um, so it's it's so standardized now that I mean actually we don't need to defend it anymore uh, as a as a as a as a way of providing services. But how did we get there? So what is interesting is that actually the first medical abortion was done in 1990. Sorry, 69 in Sweden. Um, because they were working on progesterolindins uh, in Karolinska Institute. Um, and they found that it worked as an abortion. And, they, and the, 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 the professors there and the gynecologists there, uh, they knew the potential of this. They knew how important it was. 
And uh, he got a Nobel Prize for the developing uh, the prostaglandins. Um, and so, but it, this is a history that's largely forgotten. I, I just recently found it back because actually, to be honest, I didn't even know it. Uh, and I found it back because I looked for the Nobel Prize speeches and they're talking there about the enormous importance of this. So the first medical abortion was much longer ago than many people know. Um, and then what happened is that this was a, this was a natural, <coughs> this was uh, a uh, prostaglandin that was uh, a human progesterone, and then they found that a coral in the Mexican Sea was producing it. Sorry, uh, I should put that. Uh, a coral in the Mexican Sea that was producing it, and then uh, Pfizer started producing it uh, for commercial purposes. But they knew it was working for abortion, but they were marketing it for uh, the protection of the stomach against uh, a strong painkiller. Because they knew they would, I mean, they would, and then it was like, um, uh, because, I mean, abortion was everywhere illegal. What is also interesting is that a lot of the seaweeds are also making this. So there's a lot of uh, herbs and other uh, natural ingredients that are producing this. And in the 19th century, uh, in the 18th century, people were using seaweeds uh, to induce abortion. And they thought it was because it was expanding the, the surface. But actually, probably, it's the function of the progressive glandins that was causing the abortions then. Um, so, and then Mifepristone, but it's not the most effective way to do an abortion. So, and then Mifepristone was developed in the 1980s, which is the same time the World Wide Web was invented. So, it's actually really interesting to see these two things that came together, right? What the potential has been of these two technologies merging and working together, what an enormous expansion of access to safe abortion it has caused. Um, so, anyway. If you look at the restrictions, so I'm jumping a little bit, okay? Forgive me, and I'm talking too fast. I hope you can follow me if you can't, <laughs> because I won't get to my slides if I don't talk fast. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why there's limited access to abortion. Of course, I mean, we all know legal legal, legal problems, but money is a really important uh, uh, reason that people cannot afford to pay. If it's in special clinics where people have to travel, we know that people cannot get to the clinics. Yeah, um, so these are, uh, but also, you know, people that are, are in controlling situations, uh, you know, so actually the only way to make sure that everybody can get access to an abortion they need is to make it available off the counter. Uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way now. Okay, uh, it's wrong way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, we started, um, so in order to, uh, to work, Oh yeah, okay, so this is the work that we've been doing in the past 20 years. Um, and, and we started with the idea of that you could have, based on my previous experience, if you have a, a ship that goes to international waters, you can um, provide abortions there to women that need it outside the territorial waters. Uh, the first campaign we did was in Ireland and we were not able to do any abortions, but everybody forgot about that, which is great. Um, <laughs> and then, um, uh, and then the second, and we had a lot of shit with the Dutch government and whatever. But then the second time we sailed out was to Poland. Um, and uh, that is where we actually did the first act real abortion. So I'm going to show you a little bit of footage uh, of the Poland campaign. Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, you get the idea, right? It was crazy. Uh, and I mean, we were, uh, the ship was changed, we had to have a court case to get it free, we had to pay a fine. These people that were protesting us, they, that, that was the people that were, were in, the, in the government until very recently when there were new elections in Poland. So it was, it was crazy. But um, we were able to sail out and we were able to give abortion pills. So it was an extremely important moment for us to do it. Um, but what happened is that the last day we sailed out, there were like special um, customs that where police was coming on the boat 
to really body search all the women that had chilled out with us. And what was very interesting is what we saw is that these women were actually not really afraid because we had given them pills because the second set of pills you have to take at home. And they were all passing it, passing it on to each other before they went into the cooling, you know, in this special cabin where they were going to be body searched. And then they came out and then the other ones get it. And so they were, but, um, and, and so I think what we did as activists, and that's what a lot of activists are doing, is actually we're underestim underestimating the people that need the abortions. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the, the activists are actually very, um, you know, they're always about protecting these people. And, you know, and, and, and I think we can really use the, the, the enormous strengths and, uh, and, and courage of people that need abortions. Uh, and we need to use it more. Um, so this is the mobile tr treatment room that was built by Euphonisa. Euphonisa is an artist. Um, and that was the one that you also saw on the boat uh, in Poland. And the reason is that we needed to have, a, in the Netherlands, you need to have a license for, for a clinic um, in order to be able to do an abortion. And so we, we couldn't afford a boat because the boat's really expensive. So we, we had this, this container built and we got an art grant to build it. Um, and, uh, and so actually that led to questions in the Dutch parliament uh, because you know, the, the, it was government money that went to you know, export abortion uh, thing, uh, rights. Um, and so when we were on the boat on the way to Ireland, uh, there was, I mean, a lot of things happened, but everybody was frantic. That was the first campaign we ever did. And then the Dutch government wanted to stop the boat because they said, well, the, the, the licenses of the ship are not valid anymore because you have an extra accommodation on board. And so what Juk did, uh, he sent the fax to the Dutch Ministry of uh, Sea, saying that it was not an accommodation, but it was a functional piece of art. And so they had nothing anymore to stop the boat from continuing. Um, so it was very useful also to use the legal loopholes. Um, then the, last the next campaign that we did, and I, these are, the, I think, the most crucial campaigns that we did. It really formed the, the future work of our work as well, was to port uh, Portugal. And uh, in Portugal, the government sent warships to stop the boat. So you see here our boat and then the two warships behind them. One of the abortion, one of the uh, warships was called F486. And you know that the other name for abortion pills is RU486. Mm -hmm. So it was like in the headlines, like F486 is sent to stop RU486. That was very funny. <laughs> but anyway, we couldn't take women on board anymore. We did not do any abortions in, in Portugal on the boat. But we had a lot of court cases. So we fought the government to see if we could get the ship in and we lost it. And then we, when we lost it, we launched another campaign. And that was that we announced that we would, we would um, uh, put on our website the instructions how women can do an abortion themselves with mice per stall. And in, in Portugal, you could buy it over the counter. So one of our doctors had gone to the pharmacy to buy it, and it's called Artotec. Um, and uh, and, we, and when we walked out of the courthouse, we said, this is what we're going to do. And, um, and this, is, uh, this was the next day on the television everywhere. Já this muita gente poderá ter tomado estes remédios para problemas de estômago, mas há quem os indique também para outros fins. É que estes dois fármacos vendidos nas farmácias portuguesas podem, quando administrados com uma dosagem acima do normal, provocar um aborto químico. Quem o diz é a organização Women on Waves, com o seu barco do aborto parado a 12 milhas da Figueira da Foz. So it was everywhere. Like people suddenly knew you could use these pills to do an abortion. And we had launched the hotline and the hotline got hundreds of calls. I bought the pills, what do I do now? And so that hotline has been working until abortion was legalized in 2007. Mm -hmm. And what happened with what happened when the government, which was a right-wing government, sent the warships, uh, it was a huge outcry. There was a, the, all the other political parties that came to visit the boat. Uh, it was a huge scandal. The, the, the European Union was very upset about it. The Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs went to talk with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Portugal. Like It was a really high political game. And so the government fell over this. So the Portuguese government fell two months later um, because the president was also, a, he was progressive, he was a socialist. And so, uh, and then uh, the next elections that were like in, in, so we were in Portugal in, in, I think in September, and then in, in December the elections were in the socialist won the, won the elections. 
and they did, with the promise that they would legalize abortion. So they had the referendum on abortion uh, in, in 2007 because it takes time to organize. And this was the, um, but this was like, you all, this was, an, this was an opinion poll was, was done on the boat. What do you think of the abortion vote? And you see that actually the public support was really high. So that also gave courage to the Socialist Party to say we can now move forward and put this as a really political topic because they knew they had the majority of the people that were supporting them. It was 64%, but it was a lot in the country where it's illegal. And then, um, okay, so then there was the vote and, uh, uh, and the, 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 the oh no, this is another one. So they, they won, the, the, so the, the referendum won, and abortion got legalized, and, uh, and we went to the European Court of Human Rights to fight the, the decision uh, that to stop the vote, and we won that court case uh, for the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and what, that was also important, because it, it was a precedent that you cannot stop a European ship entering another European harbor, doing something that is, you know, might, you might not like it, but it's legal. Um, so, um, and so actually this, this whole thing about giving information about my Stroll became one of the main work that we did in the coming years after. Uh, we started uh, Save Abortion Hotlines. This is one in Quito, where we hang a banner on the Virgin of Quito that's on the top of a mountain. Uh, it's in Fessel, the, film that the filmmaker Diana Witten, who's here, uh, made, uh, you can see there. Um, and it, we launched a lot of the safe abortion hotlines in Argentina when it was not legal yet, and in other countries in Europe. So a way to spread the information on the safe abortion hotline was this sending money. Um, and, um, um, and of course, Argentina legalized abortion in 2020, but it was very important for the local women's organization because before, like, the doctors were, they were holding all that knowledge for themselves. And so we worked a lot with the women's rights organizations, and that made it possible, uh, it really democratized the knowledge so that it was the women's groups that really took it on because it was for them really empowering to be able to finally do something, not just protest, but to really help people uh, in need. And um, and it, I think it also propelled like the whole, um, it, it was also a very <coughs> large part of the Green Wave movement. It was really actually giving the abortion pills to women. So uh, of course, when you know it, you just want to give the pills as well. So all the local women's groups started giving out the pills as well, like they do now here. Like there's a really strong, on the ground women's <coughs> movement that is giving out abortion pills to women that need it. And, uh, and it's very interesting that this has been so, uh, uh, so such an empowering uh, knowledge. Mm. So community trainings, um, and we also started Women on Web, and this was in 2005, because when, after the first vote campaign, we found that many people were contacting us, hey, where's the abortion vote? I need an abortion. And of course, we didn't have a vote. Uh, and it's just pills, so we need to find a way to to send the pills to people. Um, and Women on Web was the first telemedical abortion service that ever existed. We started in 2005, and a lot of the research that we did, which we started doing immediately, uh, was used for uh, for all the the guidelines that were created later. Um, and it also really changed like a lot of the perception. So, for example, the first legal the first research that we published. The Telegraph said women are risking their health by using abortion websites, and only like not even ten years later, the same the same newspaper saying, "Hey, uh, abortion pills, everything you need to know where to get them." So th th this, I mean, this is quite rare that you can really show an impact so so clearly about how it has led to a totally changed uh, perception uh, of of how safe it is. Um, now, this was the first New York Times piece where it was a beautiful cover, Abortion Pills by Mail, which was when New York just didn't exist yet, because I'm not sure whether they would have done it then. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Ireland, because we've been very involved in Ireland. Um, and so, um, in 2014, after the first vote campaign, we had been working mostly on women on web, giving a lot of abortion pills and sending a lot of abortion pills to women in Ireland. But then uh, in 2014, there was a new political party that came in the parliament and they reached out to us. They said, we're going to push this now. We want this to be uh, legalized. And, uh, and we worked with them 
to do several campaigns. One was the abortion train. So these politicians went to Northern Ireland to pick up the abortion pills um, and then to swallow it in the middle of the street uh, when they arrived on the station. And one of the arguments of the anti-abortion groups was always, oh, it's dangerous, these abortion pills. But when you have a politician taking abortion pills in the parliament, you know, that is in one second, that whole discourse is totally in the mind. So these are very important symbolic moments where it became more mainstream, more accepted uh, for people. Um, and then uh, we did an abortion drone campaign. Uh, this, oh, shit. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> the state that deny women the right to choose and, and criminalize them and was totally safe as a, as a human right. abortion pills to end their pregnancy. They have to travel a long way to England to have a safe abortion. from one country to another because you use a drone law. So the drone controller is in one country where it's not well, illegal and then it flies to another country where the woman is waiting to take the pills. We did it in, uh, so we did it in Poland and in Ireland. Uh, in Poland, the, the controllers were confiscated by the German government. Uh, and here in Ireland, they, we were called by the, by the police that asked us, are these women going to be pregnant or not? And we said, well, you know, that's the point. That's none of your business. And they said that they would stop us if we would not tell them that we did it. But we said, we, we can't tell you, and you have no right to know. And then they stand by, and they didn't actually do anything, but everybody was extremely nervous. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it helped to create a lot of awareness about the uh, abortion pills. We also, together uh, with the politician, um, uh, Ruth Koppinger is her name, we started publishing data from Ireland, and these data were, were used uh, in, in the first kind of public discussions um, in Ireland, um, you know, that because they always said people are traveling, and we showed that thousands of abortions are happening in Ireland itself. Um, and so this research was, there was a citizens' assembly, which was a, a group of people, 100 people that were going to advise the, the Irish government on legalizing abortion, and this was the first research that they were presented with. Um, and so, um, and then of course they showed like the traveling to England goes down, the use of the abortion pills goes up, uh, and uh, and then you know what, what the mandate was actually initially to um, that it would only be legal for health indications, mental health indications. But they understood then if you don't legalize it totally, then people are still going to use underground abortions. So there was a big push for this citizens' assembly to recommend unrestricted access to abortions, which was not expected at all. And I, I think a lot of the research helped to, to get it there. Um, and uh, this was also recognized by the, by the press, like but we were buying illegal abortion pills, swayed the abortion decision. Uh, and of course, the referendum was passed, and that was really a lot of really hard work on the ground by women's rights groups that went door to door uh, to fight for this uh, vote. Um, so the next thing we did, we went to Northern Ireland, and we, uh, because it was still illegal there, and we did a little abortion ro robot campaign. So the, ro the robot works like this. The robot is uh, connected with the mobile Wi-Fi, and the mobile Wi-Fi is um, so that, uh, it, but the controller, the people that control it are, were in the Netherlands in this case. It was my son that was doing it. Um, and, um, uh, 
expected the Terminator. So there were like <laughs> there were like two like three police fans, 40 police guys, fully armed, <laughs> and they were standing there threatening that they would that they would arrest everybody. It was too funny. Um, and then uh, we said no don't worry you know it's la 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 and then we had two so we, we said we can show you the, the robot. So we gave them one of the robots and they confiscated it. But we had another robot standby. And they didn't know it. So we drove the other robot out, which is from a little shoebox. <laughs> so this is my son when he was very young, when he was fighting it. Um, and he was very happy. So uh, um, this was the news around it. Um, and of course, the robots were all confiscated. We never got them back, but um, but it was still a very funny thing. Um, and again, so the idea is to play with these different legal entities. Where in the Netherlands, you know, who who is it? a robot is not a legal entity, right? So you cannot arrest a robot for delivering an abortion pill. <laughs> um, okay, and so then uh, a year later, abortion was legalized in Northern Ireland as well. Um, uh, yeah, so the next, I'm going to quit, quit this one. This was the last campaign that we did with the vote in 2017. And I don't think we will ever go and do another abortion vote campaign because, I mean, it's new times, new, like, new, new things that we need to do. Um, but I'm going to go ahead. So I'm going to skip through some of the, because I don't have a lot of times anymore, and I want to go to the, to the U.S. because that's also what you're interested in, right? Okay, so in 2018, um, uh, I started Aid Access, and, and I did this also in working together with an organization like Francine. Francine uh, Goudot is here, she's the founder, and we have been uh, partnering in here. And, um, and so, uh, and actually, the, the idea was, we, we got a lot of requests already with Women on Web, and about, you know, people from the U.S., and we realized that in order to really understand what's going on, we need to provide the abortion pills. Um, and so it was also a research project. We worked with the University of Texas, with Abigail Aiken, who was analyzing all our data. And of course, uh, after it was, legal, it was officially launched in October, in March 8th, the International Women's, uh, International Women's Rights Day, I got, a, I got a letter from the FDA to cease and desist. Um, and Francine knows, I mean, I put my head under the cover for three days, <laughs> like, what the fuck am I going to do now? Um, and then we found a lawyer that was willing to sue the FDA uh, for trying to go after me. Um, and we lost the case, but it was okay because we could start again. Um, but this, actually, this letter was signed by, I think, 120 con members of Congress, and they were all white male. Uh, and there were these beautiful blue signatures. Um, but you know, the problem is, you have a sp your, your, your speaker of the house is now one of the working ones that signed it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so I stood them back and uh, we got back in track. Um, and of course, we analyzed the data, and what we found is that mostly the most, the most reason why people were using it was cost. Nobody could afford the abortion clinics. Abortion clinics are $600 at that time. Uh, privacy. People didn't want to go to an abortion clinic because they didn't want to have to go to, a, you know, you're exposed because it's a target for anti-abortion protests. Uh, or you don't want your partner to know. You don't want anybody else to know. And distance, the traveling. Uh, so, and we saw, like, especially in the places where there was a lot of poverty, we saw how high it is. Um, and this is, for example, one of the, yeah, I mean, we get many, many, many emails from people that are eternally grateful to us, but these are one of the ones that are always kind of, um, you know, this is the people that we serve. It's people that are homeless, that are living on a couch, uh, that are, you know, with abusive people that are, 
you know, would have ended their lives. Um, and of course, now it's not only those people, but it's everybody basically in the town. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, what happened then is the FDA, uh, with COVID, they said telemedical abortion is allowed. Many other telemedicine uh, services came, uh, became active, uh, especially in the states where it was allowed, which was about 20 states. Um, and, um, and then what happened is Texas banned abortion for the first time. Uh, and but we were able to show what happens because when there's no abortion, what do people do? They are looking for alternatives, and ADEXs was an alternative. So we could show how much the in request increased. Um, and um, this is all the science. There was the New York Times showed like how uh, what happened. Um, and then of course Roe versus Wade was overturned, and then there was suddenly all these states were, that were banning abortion. And this is what happened with our website. You can see the pics. That is the days, the visitors on the days that these decisions were taken, that there was an enormous increase in, uh, in requests. And, and we also saw it here, really, really a huge increase in requests. Um, so now these are the states where it's uh, banned. Um, and of course, there are some smart people that are using these laws. This was a woman, a highly pregnant woman that was carpooling. And, and she got off, eh? she didn't have to pay the fine. Uh, that is the scary part of it, yeah. uh, oh, because right. she said, well, you know, I'm here life, I have two kids here, and I'm in my belly, so, um, and, um, uh, yeah, and this is the request going up, I mean, you can see all the data, and now the latest data was out there that actually the amount of abortions increased, when you put together all the abortion services, all the abortion pill and, and telemedicine, and I think that's really because the cost of the abortion has gone down. It was six hundred dollars, and now it's hundred fifty and free. There's, it never happened before in history. Free abortions in the United States. I mean, it's not possible to get a free abortion, and that is incredible. Um, and so I think it really helps a lot of more people. Um, so it's interesting how things that are done to restrict abortion get that it sometimes propels something else to happen. Um, okay, then, uh, now, well, we are, of course, facing, I mean, the problem is now the elections. These elections are really going to make the difference. Uh, I don't think Mif Preston will be taken off the market. If it will, ADEX is going to continue. We're working with some really badass providers. We will get the pills somehow in the country, and they're going to send it, and they will be protected by the shield law states, no matter how they're going to do it. So ADEX is not going to go anywhere, but it might have a big effect on... Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you just don't want to go there. Um, here, let me see. Okay, so when we started, so in June, so it was a mixed system. I was providing in the red states, sending the abortion bills from India, and now we only have U.S. providers based in the, the, the states where, like California, where the states are protecting the providers from extradition to the, to the red states that are providing the services. Um, and we really wanted to have people have a face. So we only went and did it. Uh, we set everybody the same risk. So all the providers are still serving all the states. And we have people that are open about it. They are willing to say they do it. Because one of the problems here is the scaremongering. Um, and everybody's been made afraid to do anything public. And I mean, you are not going to change anything when you do things on the ground. That's my sincere conviction. I think there's a lot of underground groups that are doing amazing work, and I really applaud them for them. But in order to really change the status quo, you have to be public, you have to be open about what you're doing, uh, because otherwise it's not going to really change for everything. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Okay, so I, so, I mean, this is one of the things, right? The women taking abortion pill publicly is a very strong kind of campaign tool. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I think what is very important is that as long as countries don't accommodate people to have an abortion over the counter, there will always be people that won't be able to get access to it. Because, uh, that, you know, that is a barrier. It doesn't matter what kind of barrier it is, but it is. So we, there's some taboos that we really have to start tackling as well, which is more than one tab abortion. Some women just don't want to use contraceptives. That's fine. If one abortion is okay, 
20 abortions is also okay. And I think we really have to become much less apologetic about that. Um, Self-managed abortion is still a problem. Um, but um, uh, if, if we really support people's freedom of choice, then we have to also be able to talk about these still kind of taboos uh, in public and not say that it's the last resort. No, it can be a first choice for somebody. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to use contraceptives, fine. If you prefer to use the abortion pill once a year, that's okay. Or twice a year. It's very safe. It won't do anything. It won't harm you. And it will prevent, you know, what you want to do, which is not get an unwanted child. Um, this is another artist that we work with. She's a jewelry designer. These are also her, her earrings. Uh, and these are the abortion pills. And she made a count of liberty from it. Um, so it's a kind of liberty made of abortion pills. Um, and so what is the work that we're doing now? And this is, I'm wrapping up because I'm over time. So Mifepristone is a very powerful medicine for many other indications. It's also working against endometriosis, myoma, it's a morning after pill, and we are now developing it as a weekly contraceptive. Um, and I'm going to go through this. So, um, we started the research uh, already uh, where women can use it every week, 50 milligrams of mifrostone. Uh, it doesn't have the side effects, negative side effects of the combined hormone con contraceptives. And we want this to be over the counter available. It's extremely safe. Um, the, uh, it, it, uh, there has been research done already in India and China, and we're going to repeat it in the Netherlands. So we're starting, we hope to start in August 2024. Um, and then this shouldn't be the reality anymore. <laughs> okay, I think that's my thing. <laughs> and I think, I think that is something that people usually, I mean, if you don't have fun, you cannot continue, then people get burned out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. And that, so some of the questions I have have to do with, like, how the heck you got a medical degree and an art degree and somehow learned how to do PR, how to keep people excited about it, which is a huge part of activism, how to keep that joy. Like, how did you, there's other skills that they just kind of develop as you decided you had to do the Women on Waves, or, or how did that happen? I think a lot of it is luck. Um, because, yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, so the art school thing and the medical school thing, I think it says something about the education 30 years ago that you could do that. I don't, and, and also you have to understand the Dutch, the Dutch educational system is very different. Uh, medical school is almost for free. Like here, you cannot do this because you have a huge uh, uh, debt when you're out of medical school. So everybody here has to start earning a shitload of money to pay back the debt. And then you have like, you know, this whole suing doctors thing. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it, this wouldn't be possible within the, the society that's here, for example. So, and medical school was, uh, was, I think, perhaps less challenging than here, a little bit more mellow. Mm -hmm. And the art school was in the evening. And I, I really needed both because the, the protocol and the strictness and the hierarchy of medical school kind of, uh, I didn't fit there very well. And then, you know, art school was, uh, was too sometimes. So I needed to have both. The, I needed the urgency of medicine, but the lack of protocols and hierarchy from, uh, from art school. Yeah, so I was going to ask about the, I mean, maybe just expand a little bit on what parts of your creative, energetic thinking do come from an art kind of mindset rather than a medical mindset? Well, no, I, I would say, I think what is very important, I think what made it everything also possible is that, so I think you need to be as, uh, how can I say, network theory. Do you know about this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so when you have a lot of different uh, uh, connections and do a lot of different things, the moment you bring them together, you get an expensive, things expand. And so, um, so I think that is why the two things were too important, both of them, because they were, it was not just one and one, it became an, an, an exponential possibility of things. Um, and the same happened the moment that 
uh, I tapped into the women's rights groups, which was something I never heard about before. I mean, I was at art and medicine, I mean, reproductive health groups. Oh, great, talking about that. <laughs> and then there was like this funder, Mama Kesh, she was a, they were the first funders of the abortion board campaign. She said, you cannot do that without the support of women's rights groups. So then suddenly all these little knots became together and then, you know, then things start to grow by itself. Yeah. Um, and they influence each other and they, they feed on each other. So it's not the one or the other. And, uh, and I think that's what I think um, is important for, I, I would encourage everybody to do as much as possible. I also had a, a, a degree in uh, nautical school uh, <laughs> because I needed to understand, what, you know, I needed to understand what is it to run a boat and you know, I had to take a, 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 you know, part diesel motors, which was really fun. So I, I think I'm very privileged to have been able to do all these trainings, yeah. but that's also because education in the Netherlands is basically for free. So I would say get free education everywhere and then people can do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> The other piece of the puzzle is the legal piece. So you're also, obviously, at some point, you had to start working very quickly with, you know, lawyers yeah. who understood. Yeah, but lawyers are awful. Yeah, lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, all, all, no, no, well, yes, but, I mean, all the legal papers, all the legal research we have done, basically, the lawyers said you can't do that. Uh, and that was from the moment that we had the first legal analysis for women waves. They said, you can't do that. I said, hey, are we going to do it? So tell us how we can best do it. Uh, and we run the less, less risk. And, and, and the thing is, when you say what you're doing is legal, and you are really strong and very outspoken about it, then people start believing it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's also like, that's, that's the other part of it. Because, I mean, um... Uh, and of course, we have had challenges. I've, we've had a lot of court cases. I think more than 20 court cases, for sure. Um, and, uh, and uh, for example, the last campaign, the campaign in Spain that we did, the Spanish government went after us because they said that the abortion that we did on the boat had an influence on the Spanish territory so that they could prosecute us. And it didn't go anywhere because, I mean, it's... But then the Dutch government also asked the public prosecutor to, 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 to prosecute us because they said we had violated Dutch abortion law because we had not used a licensed facility or whatever. I mean, and then the public prosecutor said they didn't want to burn their hands on it. They said, well, there's no proof that they actually did an abortion, even though we had reported that we had done the abortion. So, I mean, it's everything is also... It, yeah, I mean, I think fear is the fear is the most killing thing, and uh, and as long as you can, you know, kind of stay playful, fear is causing self censorship, and it's killing every uh, advancement that is being possible. So you need to keep kind of a playfulness and sort of kind of trust and be a bit bold sometimes, and sometimes just twist the truth a little bit. Well, what an example, because I mean, most of us are just afraid of the law. Yeah, <laughs> like, but you know, you have a pretty fucked up legal system. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a good reason. I mean, I, I didn't travel to the US for five years either after starting AIDXS, and then at some point I thought, well, you know, different, uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was under Trump that I got the letter of the FDA, and then of course Biden was elected, and you know, different FDA yeah. uh, uh, head. And so I said, okay, I can try it. But my daughter knows that we went to the US. <laughs> I was frantically deleting all the information from my computer <laughs> before going in. And we had lawyers standing by. And I said to her, you go to the customs board first. This is the contact of the lawyer that you have to call and you stop me. So I mean, I was a little bit concerned. <laughs> then nothing happened. And you're like, what the fuck? I mean, yeah. what, do you, what does it matter? Yeah. But that's interesting. You find that the lawyers are actually very, very cautious rather than like supporting you in taking these risks. No, I, I, there are, I have been lawyers that have been extremely uh, Is there supportive. That reproductive law group that you work with. No, I think there was one lawyer, Richard Hearn. He is such a bad hand. He's so great. I mean. Um, and, and I think that I actually, and, and Francine knows this as well, because we had been speaking a lot at the time that the FDA letter came out. There were nobody, nobody, none of the abortion rights groups, legal groups would ever would support me because it, I was far out of their comfort zone. 
yeah, um, far out. And then it was just Richard Turner who said, let's do this, we're going to sue the FDA. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad we did. Yeah. Well, we didn't win it, but it didn't matter. It's also, what you do is, you, you kind of, what happens is that the moment you can take your the control back and you mm -hmm. feel you can change, you can, you can, then, then that's also important with, you know, taking other people along. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the moment you can do, and we did it also after the campaign in Portugal. When we lost that court case, we couldn't get the vote into Portugal. But the moment we said, now we're going to tell women how to do an abortion yourself, it's it's take and, and there were a lot of local groups who were against that. They were really scared. But it it changed the whole dynamic again. And I think that is what, where I think things are interesting when you are able to turn the um, the things that are trying to stop you into it your advantage. That's an incredible yeah. skill. Yeah, that's really amazing. Um, no, but there were many. I mean, it's not my skill. I mean, really. I mean, I, there's so many people that, that, that take credit for this. Because, for example, my partner at the time, uh, did a Pell Talk, where he was like saying, now you have to do this, now you have to do this. So he was kind of pushing me as well. So there's many people like that are at, at, that are behind, you know, giving new ideas, supporting you, moving it forward, pushing it forward. I mean, it's, I, I really cannot take the credit for everything. I mean, I know that I get it, but it's not true. Well, you're the point person. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I was gonna ask just a couple more questions because I wanna make sure we have time for yeah. the audience. But um, the way that you at some point learned how to distill the argument so that I've seen a lot of interviews with you and I'm the kind of nerd who like uses way too many words and you know yeah. um, and with activism I guess if you could talk more about how that side of what you have become an expert at basically by default with all these interviews and the way that for example there was an ABC interview where she asked the you know, usual obnoxious, provocative question about killing babies, and you just completely, like, ref you know, you didn't like obviously refuse. You just answered something different in a very distilled way that pointed to what you're trying to do. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about. Yeah, I think that's something that you learn. I mean, yeah. it's never, you don't need to answer the questions. Uh, of course, politicians are really good at that. Uh, all the time, they're doing it all the time. Yeah. Uh, but that is part. I mean, that's part something that I learned. Uh, and and I, I had a friend that was doing some media training with me in the in the very early beginning. So, right. um, I think one of the things that I realize is being a doctor is giving you a lot of credibility, um, and uh, and to use that is very important. Um, um, and um, I think that helped me a lot as well, that I was a young woman and that the, the media likes that. So there was a lot of that in media kind of interested. I mean, to be honest, the media propelled this whole, uh, this whole project. So the beginning. Um, so, so actually I had written a book and I wanted the book to get some attention and there was a journalist who was interested, but he was not interested in the book, but actually in the, in the story of Freedom Wave. There was not an organization yet at all. I hadn't found anything, but he had written the story about Freedom Waves. And uh, and then he called the Minister of, uh, at that time, of Development in the Netherlands and he said, hey, what do you think about this? And I mean, it was nothing yet, right? It was just this idea. And she said, oh, great idea. And then the next day on the front page of the Dutch newspaper, it said, uh, the Minister of Development is supporting the abortion shift. And I mean, there were Christians in the parliament without ever, there was no organization yet. And then that that started like going to other countries. And then at some point, it, there was an interview in Daily Telegraph. And they said, um, are you going to go to Malta? I said, sure, I'm going to go to Malta. And then in Malta, there were the discussions in the parliament to make me persona non grata. And it was the front page news of the International Herald Tribune at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and there was nothing ever happened. So there was something in this story that was so powerful. It was so mythological. And I think that is, 
it's like this imagination of women, pirates, uh, and then something like abortion. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, it, it has something mythical yeah. to it. So yeah, it's, it, it, and it helped. And then the funders saw, hey, fuck, this is working. Yeah. So then, then it was possible to get funding to do, uh, to do the first campaign. Yeah, that was the Ireland story. Yeah. Where, like nothing actually happened. But yeah. Everybody thought it did. So, yeah. yeah. And nobody remembers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess that leads to my last question, was which is whether you could help us solve all the other problems in the world. <laughs> Give us some <laughs> strategies <laughs> to revolution. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, discrimination against LGBTQ yeah. and especially trans people anti-migrant yeah. sentiments in a world where so many people are being forced into migration, the rise of authoritarianism, like are there some skills we can distill from this so we can all go out in boats and... Absolutely, I'm a one, one issue person. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, I mean, it's, it's, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but that it, it just means overturning the way the society works, which I think is a good idea anyway. Um, but uh, how to do that? I, I, I you know, it's, I can't do a call for arms here, so, but that's what it will take eventually, I think, kind of things, to be honest. Well, I'm guessing each, each issue would involve micro strategies at a specific place and time. I don't think so, to be honest. No. I think you need a systematic change. Yeah. Uh, and this is, I mean, this is a way that you can play around. Uh, and the, the, it works for this because of the, all the different laws and because of the different technologies that exist. This works because there's abortion pills, because you have different laws in different states or different countries. Uh, and that isn't there, but there are not a lot of topics like that. That is not a topic with immigration. It's not a topic with else to be right back you right uh, people are in that state being prosecuted and being harassed and being um, I don't know of any other topic that has this this, this potential yeah. to be honest so I, I'm afraid it will need it will require systemic change. because this is a problem with you know you've managed to define it as having a singular solution really like there's this fairly simple way yeah to give women control over their reproductive rights yeah. and their bodies. Yeah. yeah. But it's not untouchable, huh? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. That was one of my more complicated questions. Yeah. I'll leave no, aside. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, questions from the audience. We've got roving mics and uh, questions or comments. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I have been a long time fan of Little Ways. Um, I just had a comment and a question. Um, I had an abortion in 2015. I did misoprostol in my bedroom. Yeah. And it was very... Um, it was painful. <laughs> it was painful. Yeah, that's a, one of my side questions. It's like, did these women, after they took it, like, go home? Were they really taking the actual misoprostol? Because I started bleeding out, like, 30 seconds later. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, I mean, let's wow. be honest, it's it amazing. can be pretty fucking shit. Yeah. 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 It was pretty fucking shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, and it was, and I really like that you brought up abortion taboos, which is what I wanted to ask you about, because um, I remember I went to my insurance provider and they were trying to not cover it, and they were like, it's $600. And I was like, I, I just walked past all the people with the signs, because I had to do it at a clinic, you know, and then they are like, oh, sorry, we cover one abortion a year. And I was like, cool. <laughs> Got it. So anyway, it was covered because I only had one portion that year. But what I wanted to bring up was that like a year later I came out as trans. And so I'm a trans person who's had an abortion. And I think about this. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I think about this question a lot. I made um I made a video called Herbal Abortions with Julia Child where I had a trans drag queen play Julia Child and we <laughs> taught people how to do herbal abortions. Great. I mean, I, I love this stuff. I'm a huge fan. I've had an abortion. I'm very public about it. But I just wonder about the, how to include trans people in your movement. Yeah. Um, there were two films that came out last year. One's called Trans Bodies, Trans Choices, and one's called My Abortion Saved My Life. They're both by trans slash media, and they're about trans people who have to seek abortion access. And there's just a lot more barriers to access when you're yeah. trans. It's yeah. very scary to go through yeah. that system, even if it's legal. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was my question. I, I totally thank you so much, and I totally recognize it. And I'm also sorry, I'm kind of a little bit old fashioned. So I used to talk about women, but I mean all people with your dresses, but it's kind of this is really a generational thing, and I, I, I try to. Keep up, keep up, but it's kind of hardwired in my brain. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but yes, it's definitely it's a huge challenge, and um, and uh, and we have. I mean, with eight access, there's a lot of trans people that are using eight access, um, and it's and it's complicated also because uh, the, uh, you know we ask for an ID. And then when people send a mail ID, we ask them, you know, if they are, if the abortion is for themselves, basically. Because you want to make sure that it's not somebody that tries to give somebody an abortion against their will. Um, um, but um, I think trans care here in general is also really problematic. Uh, and, and I think that's, that is not just the US, but it's also the, the, the uh, um, the, the stigma around it, um, and uh, and the medication that people need that which is not covered, and then ah uh, yeah, I mean yeah, it's an issue. Yeah, so uh, we try to we try to be inclusive as much as as, as we can. Yeah, I would just say this not only for the people who are sort of afraid to get care, but also what you're doing with the minds of Prostown is is amazing because it suppresses. Um, Sorry, which hormone was it? Progesterone. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah. And um, the reason why I said it is because, of, like, that can be helpful for PMDD and endometriosis and yeah. PCOS. A lot of trans people also have and those then, things. Yeah, exactly. And so it's yeah. like we need access to those medications, yeah. not just for abortions, but for other kinds of care. Yeah. Actually, it would be super interesting to see what with Mimi Mikperson uh, weekly will do on that, uh, the side effects of trans uh, treatment. And I, I, I never thought about it. And it will be definitely something that we should do in the in the, in the future after. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your abortion story. Yeah. I had an abortion too. I don't know many people here. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, you mentioned that playfulness is something that's kept the, the drive going and kind of prevents burnout. Was there ever a time when you found it hard to be playful, and how did you kind of, how were you able to continue to keep that playfulness alive? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I think we all get discouraged with the with way things develop sometimes. And, um, um, how do you keep it alive? Oh. Well, <laughs> community. Uh, yeah, people, community is important. Family, whoever your family is, community. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Of course. I mean, your the the, 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 the your closest people are very important, uh, and also to keep you grounded. Uh, and to to relativate a lot of the things as well. Um, I think the community. I, I think one of the things that I find hardest is there's a lot of uh, bad energy in the abortion rights movement and groups. Um, and I think part of that has to do with that it's underfunded. Uh, that that. But also, I think it's a lot of part of that is perhaps also a lot of the topics that are. You know, left-wing topics where um, people, when they disagree, uh, they start to be um, um, how do you call it? Uh, myself, that uh, how how much uh, agency I have, uh, and, and I created for myself in, by doing all these years. Uh, and I think it's very different when your agency is constantly be taken away because you become a different person uh, when you have that happening. So I, I think we have to realize that reality is so different for many people. I think for me, the Dutch situation was very important, that you don't feel like you are 
expose. I mean, I've always had social security. Uh, you know, I have a social housing. Uh, my 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 basic core is secure. And I think that is essential when you want to go out and fight the world. Uh, it, you need to have a secure basis where your livelihood is protected. Um, and if not, so I think that makes it very easy to be playful if you don't have that. And I think that is really different in the US where people don't have that. It just doesn't exist here. So I think that is one of the most important changes in society is to, to create social security for people. Uh, that they will always be that they will always be able to have affordable housing and have a basic income. Um, and from there you can do things. So I think that these are the most important changes, systemic changes that have to be made. If you have one better Yeah, so I have as, as we all have seen in your presentation slides, um, you face a lot of aggression and you also made a lot of bold moves. And so, can you tell us a little bit how you weigh your risk as well as your action? And how did they, um, how do you, which one do you, like, how do you choose in that moment what to do? Oops. Uh, <laughs> I think sometimes I do things before weighing the risk. Yeah. But, um, uh, yes, I think that, that, that sometimes you analyze the risk afterwards. <laughs> so maybe just, uh, yeah, one more question. You should introduce yourself. Um, I'm Francine, and I'm a friend of Rebecca's, and I just want to tell you, Rebecca, what I see that is so amazing, that I've seen in no one else, it, and it does have to do with the art and the medicine part, um, it's, it's that you're so strategic, and at the same time you think outside the box, you're able to think outside the box, so when you look at all the things you've done, there's been step after step when you encountered an opportunity, like the first one being, oh, international law. Oh, I can use that to do to show everybody how ridiculous these borders are. I'm gonna do a ship a container. Okay. Then you, then what happens? Oh well, I don't need ships anymore because pills have just come on board. Guess what? I don't need a container anymore. I'm gonna do pills. Switch, do pills. You start AX, start uh, you know, women on board on uh, women on ways. And then it sort of becomes Women on the web. That was already women on this. Anyway, every time of the step, and the most recent one for people to know here in the US is very recent, but it's huge. Rebecca was doing aid access, was serving, helping serve um, all over, and as she pointed out, in a situation in which half the states or the red states had to wait two, three weeks for pills from India with her writing the prescription and all the blue states having providers in the US who could ship you the pills in three days. So what happens? All of a sudden there's these shield laws that come up mm -hmm. and which you all of a sudden you're realizing, wait a minute, I can use these shield laws to have even one single provider in a shielded state ship to all states. So I'm gonna switch my model to a shield law model. I think we haven't seen the end of what you're going to do, but I think that's the part that's the magic that you've been able, and why you still have, still are, are, are making change, is because you can constantly think out of the box, see an opportunity, and okay, I'm gonna do it this way. Thank you.